Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. So, my name is Avi Mendelssohn, and I'm from the Microsoft R&D Center in Israel. My background is that before uh, being in Microsoft, I was in Intel, and uh, I was the architect of this, uh, the first SIMP implementation of the core do. So actually, we start the, the uh, what in Intel they call the revolution of going from hyper-threading to multi-core uh, with this project. And actually, as part of the, the name of the presentation actually came from a bitter argument I had with that time with some of the managers that uh, they claim all the time that the future is to have thousands and thousands and thousands a core uh, on die. And I claim that it doesn't make sense. And at some point, one of the managers that bitterly argued against me gave a talk, and the talk was, the title of the talk was, if we build it, will they use it? And this was the question, uh, and I like the, the, the idea, so actually the title of my talk again is that the massive parallel uh, system, uh, w will you be able to program it? And I think that this is the key question about all the future of this industry. So what we'll do, uh, we'll go, uh, oh, th th this is just a, a disclaimer because what I'm going to present, I'm sure that about 90% of Microsoft employees will not agree with me. Uh, so I just said uh, these are my ideas, so this is not my Microsoft uh, 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 talk in that sense. What we'll do, uh, I I'll try to very fast explain why heterogeneous system, what is the motivation, a different type of heterogeneous system, and then we'll start discussing about uh, the programmability uh, of heterogeneous systems and wh why the programmability is the major issue and why it is important. Okay, so let's start with a small motivation. By the way, I have a half an hour. Yeah, yeah. So let's start with a small motivation of the trend of system developing, and I think that this is important because all this market for many, many years is driven by what is called Moore's Law. And Moore's Law, actually, there are many different uh, 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 types or, or different quote of it, but what it really means that the, uh, every two years on average, you expect the system to, 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 to double the, the capability, to give you a, a, a more performance, less power, etc., cetera, uh, uh, approximately every two years. And the implication were, first of all, it add a, a value to the user, allow innovation, but actually it has two other uh, important values. First of all, it allows to maintain prices and revenue of both hardware and software industry. And as we all know, this is important at least for the companies. And more than that, uh, uh, it prevents the, the software and the hardware from becoming commodity. And commodity means actually to, to, to lower the, 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 the revenue. It means less money for research, less investment, and so and so and so. So what's happened? What's happened is that uh, for many years, actually, uh, we could uh, without going to all the details, we could double the performance and we could give all the time new benefit to users without changing the basic programming model. And this was very important because we could use the same algorithm, the same methodology, uh, uh, and provide value uh, uh, to the users. Now, uh, what's happened recently <coughs> is that because of uh, power issues and because of process issues, we cannot continue, or the, the hardware industry cannot continue to give more uh, a single performance uh, 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 to, to improve the single uh, uh, thread performance. 
which actually falls from the software point of view. It forced the, 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 the system to go to parallel processing, but worse than that, it forced us to change the programming methodology. So it is not just a matter of writing the, the, uh, the same program in a different way. It is a matter of writing it in a different methodology. And we found out that most of the people doesn't have the capability to write the, the, the program uh, in an efficient way. Two other things which are important for modern architecture, power equal performance, which means that if you reduce power, you get more performance. It is a little tricky. I will not go into all the details. But just remember that when uh, today we said that we build system for low power, so actually it means that we can give you more performance. This is the real implication. And for the same area, as long as parallelism exists, then in most cases it is more efficient to double the, the number of processing units or processors than to double the frequency. So as long as parallelism exists, actually it indicates that it is much, much better to, to, to increase the number of processors. And uh, since we said that power equal performance, so actually you can get much, much more performance by going to power systems. A good example is uh, uh, graphics uh, uh, computers. In graphics, we, have, we assume that we have infinite amount of parallelism. And then we see that we have a lot of small processors that try to do the work. And this is the trend. The only problem is the optimal number of cores is usually depend on the software characteristic and not on the hardware capabilities. And it goes back to some deep understanding that modern a, a, a system depends on software and hardware. And we cannot continue to build software and hardware totally independent. They are tightly connected between the software capabilities and the hardware uh, capabilities. So soon after we start seeing different types of a, a, a parallel system, multi-core usually a, a means to maintain backward co a performance compatibility, compatibility with single thread application. So we put actually what a, a, a we call a big cores, and we, we put as many as we can, but without losing single thread performance. Many cores actually means that you put as many a, a cores that you can, and you will to lose single thread performance. It's similar, as I said, in the case of a, a graphic. Heterogeneous uh, processors combine the different types of parallel computing because the idea is that part of the, the, the program will need the signature performance. The rest may need only parallel a, 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 a code. And so why not partition the, the system in such a way that it will be more power efficient because part of it is massively parallel. The other parts are not massively parallel. So let's start a, a try to, to, to get the best of the two worlds. The only question is, can we program such systems? And again, this is the main focus uh, of my talk. So just uh, for a small testimony, we have single uh, thread. We have many cores, multi-cores. And then we go to heterogeneous uh, cores that try to combine them. But even for more, uh, heterogeneous cores, we'll see that we have many plus uh, multi-cores. We have cores with FPGAs we, uh, that gives another form of parallel uh, execution. And we have component-based system on a chip. We'll extend it uh, uh, later on. And each of these classes actually has different problems, uh, uh, different uh, uh, plus and minuses. So again, for uh, different types of heterogeneous, we have same ISA. For example, if you put Atom and x86 together on the same die, there are systems today at least they do it at, the, at least at the level of a, a system level, not at the level of a, the die. But if you put Larabee, a, a core a, with a x86, actually they have almost the same a, a, a instruction set, a, but with different capabilities. You can put different ISA. A good example is AMD. Put CPU and GPU. Or each of them is totally different a, a, a instruction set programming environment, etc., on the same die. And then we have the system on a chip. 
Good example is smartphones that integrate IP from different companies. In many cases, each part has its own software, its own stack of software. And the interesting part is the time to market is the main characteristic of systems uh, that, that go to that direction. Because the most important part in system of chip is to be able to ship it to the market as soon as possible. So even other system, the, cru the most crucial uh, uh, part is to be able to get the best performance power and so on. In most of the system on the chip, the first of all, you want to be the first to go to the market, and then you start improving uh, uh, your system. So the integration and the, the how the software and operating system integration is the, the, the main motivation uh, to do it. So before I continue, actually, it, it gives me some kind of deja vu because if you look just on the 80s and 90s, we had a very similar story. The hardware manufacturers came and said, okay, you know, we cannot uh, 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 manipulate, uh, uh, manufacture anything beyond 33 megahertz. And uh, I can still remember a paper that explained because the logic analyzer cannot run faster, so you will not be able to test it, etc., etc., etc. With all the justification, that 33 megahertz is the maximum frequency that you can ever uh, use. And then we, uh, the, the world start go to parallel, and we had this time. Uh, sorry, we 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 had multi cores, and we had many cores and very few come a, 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 of this idea become commercially successful and many companies went bankrupt because of this idea. And so the question is if we are repeating ourselves, cheating ourselves that we cannot actually accelerate the, the single third performance or something else and actually going to a wrong direction. So the question was what stopped the previous wave of parallelism? And the real answer, it was software issues. Because we could continue build even that time parallel system, the, the, the connection machine for, I think that they had something like uh, 8,000 uh, cores, but in the manual it was written, never used more than 1,000 because the software cannot handle it. So the problem was never uh, uh, being able to build a, a massive parallel systems. The real problem was how to use them. So we lack the, the, the tools and operating system, parallel system were relatively expensive, which are not right now. But another thing was that each time the technology hit a single type performance wall, a miracle happened. Miracle, I mean that when TTL ran out of steam, CMOS appears. When frequencies seem to scale and not to scale anymore, new uh, lithographic uh, 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 appears. And then when in-order machine could not drive a significant uh, more performance, so out of order was invented. The only problem that we have right now is that there is no miracle scheduled yet. <laughs> so we try to schedule one, but if you look on processes and so on, nothing uh, uh, th th there are a lot of attempts, but there is no future technology that we can really think that it will replace the CMOS in the next 10 or 20 years. So people are talking about putting, using diamonds instead of CMOS. Very neat idea, very expensive one. Uh, there are all these biology chips. I asked one of the, the, the person when it will be reality. He told me, 200 years, I believe that it will be a hit. So there's nothing, maybe people will find something, but right now we don't have any technology that we can rely on. And the question is that since no miracle is, is scheduled soon, uh, uh, have we solved all the software issues that stop the, 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 the past uh, parallel way? Because if not, so maybe we will repeat the same a, a, a pattern again. So again, <coughs> this is the motivation of the oh, 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 of my talk, and uh, I'll try to focus mainly on heterogeneous systems. But before that, even though it is not the scope of the talk, I want to 
say a few uh, words about many cores and multi cores, and you see that it, it, it is connected. So actually, if you ask the, the industry about five years ago, uh, if they think that uh, uh, we have a problem with the programmability, most of the people tell you, no, no, we have transaction memory. Transaction memory, this is a software miracle. It will solve all the, 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 the parallel issues. Unfortunately, it is not mature enough even today, and uh, there is much, much less research uh, on this area. And uh, uh, there, there, there is still research, but the industry at least uh, stopped spending a lot of money uh, in this direction. So maybe it will become the, 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 the programming model in the future, but right now uh, it is still not mature enough, and people believe that if it will be mature enough, it will be for many cores, but it will not solve the problem of multi-core at that point. Personally, I believe the transaction memory are in the right direction, but again, it will take at least another 10 years uh, to, to, to find the right models, to solve the problems, uh, etc. Perhaps transaction memory is more suitable for concurrent programming rather than parallel programming. Yeah, of course, yeah. So, new programming models uh, are taking too long to adapt, we, we, we know, so there are plenty of new programming models. Uh, uh, each one of them has at least 10 people that uh, can advocate for them, but it is not enough for most of the industry. Uh, so we have a lot of attempts and uh, no one actually uh, 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 attract uh, the, the majority of the programmers. We have a lot of techniques like uh, auto-parallelization and auto-vectorizations very, very encouraging uh, uh, results. By the way, they had very encouraging results 20 years ag uh, ago as well. Uh, still, it is not a, a, it doesn't give us the, uh, the parallelism that, that uh, uh, we need. Uh, we are back to data flow. Or right now, it's called task level parallelism. Uh, personally, I am involved in two projects that actually do task, uh, uh, data flow or task parallel. A, a, a parallelism, task level parallelism, it's still a niche. Again, it will take time to prove if it is the right or wrong. Log for algorithms are great, but very hard to implement. And the cloud it contains large number of computers, but each single instance is still very small. So it is good for parallel system for some sense, but not for the, the, but it will not replace the programming model for massive parallel system. And uh, by the way, a cloud computer in many sense go against the, 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 the uh, direction of how the company that want to sell you more computers because what cloud is doing is actually put a, m many machines on the same hardware. So instead of buying more hardware, you will buy less hardware. So from the, the, the a revenue point of view, it doesn't solve the problem, it makes it even uh, 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 tougher. So all this direction may take too long uh, to become a mainstream and uh, to save the software for becoming commodity. This is my uh, 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 conclusion. So programming a heterogeneous system is not something uh, uh, new. Heterogeneous system actually, as I said, introduced again as a solution for power efficient systems. And uh, we have few systems that try to combine CPU and GPUs. Uh, so, sorry, CPU and FPGAs. FPGA usually are programmed uh, with uh, VHDLs. There are very few people that, must, that know how to master C++ and VHDL and to optimize the system. So it is very good a solution for specific domains with an expert people, but it is not general purpose. There are few environments that do C to VHDA, but again, they are great for a domain specific, not for general purpose. So we start seeing a lot of work on uh, using a, a, a general purpose GPUs, and general purpose GPU or GPU GPU is the term of using GPUs for doing com computation which are non-graphic computation. This is the reason that they call them general purpose. But it is not general purpose. These are very specific classes of, 
of mathematical works that you can do on graphics. So it is true that it is not graphic workload, but it is not general purpose a workload, at least not now. So it is very easy to write, very difficult to debug and optimize. Professor Wen Mei Hu uh, did an, a, a, a very a, a nice experiment. He took PG, very bright PhD students, teach them CUDA, and let them uh, program uh, uh, through uh, some summer uh, 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 seminar. And the results were amazing. It took them about, uh, after they, they, they learned the basics, it took them about one or two days to take uh, the algorithm and convert it to CUDA. And another two to three months to optimize it. So if you want to run a, a, a CUDA, which is the language of NVIDIA, a for a GPGPU, it is very simple. It is very hard uh, to optimize it. OpenCL is something that Apple drives. It is open source, but you cannot change a world without getting the approval of Apple. So it is a open Apple source, uh, but a, which is very similar to CUDA. And the idea was to do something general so actually they can decide when to move from NVIDIA to AMD or to ATI. So because if the, you use something that can be translated to both environments, so the, the software will, be, will not be dependent on the hardware. Uh, but, but again, same phenomenon. So it is usually mainly for a limited number of algorithms and data structures. Uh, only experts can develop efficient GPGPU even today. Uh, there are a few works, including myself, of uh, using short virtual address space between the GPU and the CPU. Uh, it, uh, it solved many of the problems, but it is still uh, uh, not a, a, a sol it doesn't provide a solution that, uh, that uh, non-expert people uh, can use. So few other possible direction, and I'll do it very fast. One is heterogeneous OpenMP. The idea is to be able to divide the system to island of coherency, and uh, then each island can behave differently. So in one island, you can uh, have GPU, and in another, you may have CPU, and so on. Each island can uh, have either CUDA or, N a, 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 or OpenMP uh, to control it. And uh, you connect the, the islands by using MPI-like layer. And the uh, MPI complicate in, is complicated enough for most of the programmers. Uh, and the combination of MPI and OpenMP make it uh, either uh, uh, even more complicated. So this is a nice solution, but uh, again, go to a very few people and expert people uh, can use them. Another interesting idea came from Intel, and it is called CT. The idea here is to have something like library of data structures that you know how to parallelize it. So they, they tell you, OK, if you are going to use this data structure, so automatically it will produce the code for you. Actually, it is synthesize the code for you and use the, the parallel machine. This parallel machine can be many core, a multi-core, heterogeneous core. I'll go back to this solution uh, because I think that this is a very interesting uh, 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 approach. So programming system, a, a heterogeneous system when you use the system on a chip. So the idea here is, again, to, to be able to, to, to use the system on a chip uh, to do very fast uh, uh, development. So the most important thing here is time to market. And, but still, it needs to be a power efficient, etc. So we need to, we, we need to extend the operating system to support different simultaneously a, a OS to run a, a simultan a, a simultaneously. For example, a, in the past, Intel thought a, a, to run the, the, the Larby and Windows a, on, on the same chip or together. Larby was managed by Linux, Windows managed by Windows, of course. And now you need to build a system that part of it will be managed by Linux, part of it will be managed by, uh, by Windows. It is not a trivial uh, 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 trick. The convert, 
you may say, okay, virtualization may solve it, but the current virtualization are not cost effective, not from the hardware point of view, not from the software point of view. So right now it is not the right solution uh, 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 to, to solve this problem, maybe in the future. Balfish is a project uh, that uh, uh, try to address uh, this. We don't have enough time to go into the details, but it may uh, so significant. Uh, it, it has significant progress to be toward uh, the right direction, but still, uh, I believe it, uh, it is far away from being a commercial. So we need new software and hardware, and uh, 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 we need new verification and testing techniques uh, uh, to, to, to such a system. So since I run out of time, I'll try to, to, to do it very, very fast, the, the summary. Uh, about the, in general, the computer industry moved to parallel system, not because they like it, because they force uh, uh, to do it, because signal trade performance uh, run out of steam. And the effect of commodity software is already happening. And a good example is that most of software for cellular phones are, be, uh, are being sold for one or two dollar. Companies like Apple, Intel, Microsoft, so on, cannot live with the software which is sold by one or two dollars. So we start seeing that uh, many of these companies uh, actually start looking at uh, uh, getting money for infrastructure and services and so on, but less and less by developing uh, new applications, which is, I think that this is a very bad a sign to, 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 to the market because most of the money for research come uh, from the, the big companies. So, a, a heterogeneous system. A, I believe that the trend to build a heterogeneous system mainly to provide better power performance will not last uh, long. And the reason is going back to things like CT. If you look few years in the future, what's happened? is that this data structure will become a standard way to solve it, and then, uh, uh, like the floating point in the past, it will be integrated as part of the core, and will go back to sing single thread with uh, primitives that can be translated like uh, vector machines or string matching uh, 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 units, and so on, so on, so on. System on a chip will, uh, uh, will last if we find ways to build software that supports fast uh, trial time to market, but there are a list of, this is the short list of problems that we need to, to, to address portability of models, interfaces, testing verification, operating system resource management, and so on. So, system machine will continue to depend on a high quality expert uh, at given fields. And the question is if large companies will be flexible enough uh, to make the change because this is not the situation uh, uh, right now. Questions? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Louis Poole has recently reinvented this idea of map reduce uh, higher order functions coming from the old traditional uh, functional languages. Yes. What about, what about this? Map reduce, again, it is a good idea. It is uh, mainly meant to, to a specific type of uh, uh, application. Uh, Again, algorithms that can be solved by MapReduce or Dryard, which is the, the Microsoft uh, version of MapReduce, uh, uh, can, uh, uh, be, uh, can take advantage of parallel systems. But if you look on many, many applications, uh, but again, MapReduce is something that you need uh, expert in order to, 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 to use it. It's not something that most of the programmers uh, 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 can use. Uh, we can teach them. So there, there is a, big, a long uh, argument, yes, we need to change all the, the, the education in the high school, the education in university, I totally agree. But it will take 20 years. So MapReduce is some intermediate uh, a solution for problems that can, be, can use MapReduce, etc. It is not for the general purpose, not for the massive uh, 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 applications. I cannot see in many fields a, a good solution using a MapReduce. Can you apply operators to these fields? Yes. What, what 
Yes, yes, I'm saying that for, 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 for the areas that it can uh, help, it is do a, a tremendously good job, similar to, to GPGPU. If your application is free to, uh, uh, if your application has a, a massively parallel, uh, independent operation, so GPGPU can uh, be very useful. So there are class of application that uh, uh, this parallel system can benefit. But not, but even not the majority ones, and you need to rewrite the the, the entire sort of stack that you have. So the, the, these are the real issues that you want that you want to move forward. You can move forward relatively easy the uh, new programs, uh, uh, etc. It is very difficult to, to to move all the billions of uh, uh, programs or code that exist today, and this transition will take a long time. The question is what big companies will do during that time. They need to get money somehow. I think, I think we should uh, stop there and move ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so next election, uh, uh, <coughs> who's a, 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 an academic university of Cambridge who's going to tell us about his vision of computing beyond a million cores. Uh, do I click it? Oh, what a good idea. Uh. Thank you very much, Satnam. You all hear me. Right. So, I'm Simon Moore. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Avi, for uh, kicking this session off. Um, so, the title is uh, uh, partly provocative. How do we think towards uh, computing with larger numbers of cores? I mean, let's get out to a million, and I'll uh, talk about one project where we are looking to build a, a one million arm, uh, arm core system, in fact. So, I'm going to start off with a bit of motiv motivation. Uh, give you my slant on why we want to do this, what some of the issues might be, and so on. Then talk about prototyping concept computer systems, and then finish off by just talking about some of the current projects that are going on in the computer architecture group in Cambridge. So, as I said, we now, we're doing parallelism. Finally, we really are doing parallelism. Um, but I would argue that we really sort of lack a sand pit for doing this sort of research. Uh, you know, you can go and buy an Intel-based system, that'll buy you a few cores. You know, Intel's got a prototype system, or you could go to Tylera to buy something more on the embedded side. In the UK, there's companies like Pikachip and Exmos, and they'll send you, sell you, you know, parallel systems more for the embedded space. There's GPUs, but they're not really that general purpose yet. You know, you could go and buy an IBM Blue Gene, but basically there is a bit of a problem if you actually want to think about, you know, mapping software onto a system with a thousand cores, where do you actually start from? Okay. I'd also argue that you know there's a lot of people who look at things like we've talked about map reduce that map onto clusters, you know. So people are building software to fit current hardware and being really quite constrained and, and I would even argue blinkered by this current hardware. Um, so I think it's actually start, you know, cluster computing, great, fine, it's for the now, but I mean, come on, this is just ridiculous. Okay, it's commodity stuff, but we ought to be able to buy, uh, build computer systems where, you know, you add more compute, you add more memory units, and you build a bigger single computer, not lots of independent, loosely coupled systems, okay? PC clusters in particular lack low latency communication. And this really impedes a lot of software models. And you get the same problem with GPUs. If you've got you know, a couple of GPU cards, fine. If you want to connect 100 of them together, you're stuffed. Um, so I'm really interested in how to explore new programming paradigms. You know, things like partition global address spaces, stuff like that. Uh, we want to explore extensible computer systems. So you know, one big uh, parallel. Uh, redundant computer system, not a cluster of independent systems. Okay, so that's where I want to go. Let's talk a bit about technology drivers. Avi's already mentioned quite a lot and why we're here. One of the things I would argue is that uh, there's actually been a, a big uh, technology push actually is wire scaling. Uh, let me just explain to this. If we look at chips, um, over the last 40 years, as we started putting everything on one chip, okay, one thing that has changed very little is the actual physical size of this chip. 
okay? It's a few millimetres, maybe up to about 20 on a side. Well, why is that important? Well, actually, if you look at the RC time constant of a wire, if we just do basic electronics, then the time to move data from one side of the chip to another has actually changed very little in 40 years. Now, 40 years ago, you didn't worry about the wiring. It was lightning fast. Today, it's really quite different. So let me give you some numbers. And let's think about uh, communications and the power of uh, the cost of communication versus computation. So actually, these are numbers I stole from Bill Daly, who's now the CTO at NVIDIA, was a head of department at Stanford. Um, so let's look at this. If we're transferring 32 bits of data across chip, you know, back in 2006, that was about the same amount of power as doing 20 arithmetic operations. Moving to what you can easily buy today, okay, we were getting up to sort of 60 computations. But if you're looking off chip, it really becomes quite staggering. You know, just moving 32 bits of data off chip to some DRAM, you're using the same amount of power as well over a thousand arithmetic operations. And this trend is continuing. So, I believe that communication and the, is going to become more and more important okay, to the way we build systems. And as a consequence, we need to treat that as a first class uh, design objective. Okay, so electronics technology very much favours transistors over wires. Okay? And what we're doing in my group is primarily exploring actually the, the numerous implications of that. And I think we, we probably need to start rethinking complexity. So uh, we, you know, we teach our students so much about computational complexity. And if you want to write an efficient algorithm, it's about the computation. Well, I would argue it's really got to turn itself around. And we've got to think much more about the communication in systems. And in fact, this already happens in VLSI. For instance, you know, people designing chips know that it costs uh, area and it costs time and it costs power to move data from one side of the chip to another. And if you do a place and route job with a current CAD tool, it will do things like duplicate logic. It will recompute things rather than transmit them. Okay? I think we'll see exactly the same thing in the software domain running on multiple processors. You have a choice and there may well be a lot of situations where it will be cheaper to recompute things rather than uh, communicate them. Okay? And it, I think, I believe it's going to change the way we think about software systems. So let, you, let me give you a quick uh, example of this. And I think you need to think about this in the context of building larger scale systems, okay? Because uh, technology scaling in the small still keeps working for many years to come. So if we're talking about little bits of code and little bits of data, it's not a problem old models work. When we start talking larger data structures, large compute systems, if we just take something simple like a binary tree traversal, then, you know, as a good computer scientist, we would know that the, the cost of actually traversing that grows order log n. However, if we actually physically place that tree over some distributed structure, okay, if we do a random placement on that, then actually the complexity is order root n log n, which is substantially worse. And if we do an optimized placement, then it becomes root n, you know, which is a very different order of merit from just looking at the computational complexity. OK, let's have another think about uh, communications in systems. And let's just look at something from the VLSI domain. So this guy, this is an observation from Rent, I think it was at IBM. Um, he was looking at how to predict the complexity of communication in chips. And in fact, one of the things this predicts is that we have more and more communication. So if you imagine we've built a system, it's got four blocks connected together. This might be on chip, so we might be talking processors or, and memories. You could even be talking individual gates. And then you say, right, next generation of system, we're going to have more of those. That's fine. And they're sort of connected up the same. But then the other thing you tend to find is you get this extra layer of communication over the top. And in the VLSI domain, 
this manifests itself by us needing ever more layers of metallization on chips. And when I first got involved in designing chips, you've got two layers of metal. And these days, you get up to about 12 layers of metal. The amount of communication has gone up. And actually, I was saying to one of my PhD, I had a really bright guy, Dan Greenfield, who's, who's now graduated. And I said, well, it's kind of interesting. Does this also apply if we dynamically route this stuff? So if we have networks on chip? And in fact, he went away and did some really nice work. In fact, I'm hoping you get some sort of prize for it. Um, he sort of demonstrated that we see the same sort of things for many cores communicating on a dynamically routed network. He also then went and had a look at communications in software. So if you just take some algorithm and you just look at the dynamic data dependency graph, so you just run the code and you look at the communication between registers and between different levels in the memory hierarchy, you start seeing that you can apply this rent type scaling to software. And then I thought, ah, OK, so could we also do this for a really big parallel system? So we got involved with some neuroscientists and started looking at communication patterns in mammalian brains. And in fact, got a journal article out with them. I, I didn't think I was going to get something in a, in a you know, biological uh, setting. So in fact, it, was, it turns out that you can use these models to predict the amount of white matter in mammalian brains. So that's kind of interesting. OK. And you can also use it to do basic things like I had another student look at, these are just spec benchmarks, and this is the utilization in a cache. So the bars indicate the amount of live data. Another way of looking at this, you'll see that an awful lot of these bars are below about 30%, which means about 70% of a second level cache in a modern process is holding dead data, data you will never use again. Okay. And so both from measured and from these derived rent rule numbers, we can actually say that the cache efficiency grows with the order root the size of the cache. So that's another scaling problem. But it's been fascinating to see that these communication patterns you know, have important results at many different scales. OK. So, I want to, so here I am. I want to uh, look at communication scaling issues. And I want to look at it for you know, larger systems, you know, many, many processors. Um, you know, how are we going to go about this? Well, let's pick ourselves a, a possible concept computer system. Okay? And this is based on technologies that are either here or coming soon. So we're starting to be able to do things like, you know, put a number of cores on a chip. I picked a number. You can argue about the number you like. We can have some caches on there. We could have a, we can do some die stacking. Uh, we can add, uh, you know, caches and on-chip network. We can start adding memory. We're already seeing, you know, people like Apple, the iPad has uh, the memory is die stacked in the same package because it reduces power, and that's likely to happen uh, increasingly. So you'll be buying chips which basically have all these features and then also have a communications layer. And uh, in fact, there's been work at Intel on silicon modulators and all sorts of things, so we can add a communication layer, and this really becomes important as we start pushing towards gigab uh, sort of 100 gigabit communication rates, which you just can't effectively do on copper. And you might say, oh, this sounds a bit wacky, but actually a lot of these technologies exist. Uh, so for instance, the photonics one you might think is really out there, but as I said, people like Intel already have silicon modulators. Uh, this is some other work going on in Cambridge, just across the road from where I am, where they've been looking at making uh, printed circuit boards using polymer waveguides. And uh, in fact, this stuff works incredibly well. In fact, uh, it was a little side story. I was talking to Professor White, and he was saying he's got this new student and told him to go away and measure the signal loss on this PCB. And you know, he went and eyeballed the numbers. And he said, no, you can't have measured that right. Go and try again. <laughs> Put the student back. And in fact, no, it really does work that well. OK. So if I wanted to prototype something like this, you know, several thousand cores. Um, we've got, you know, we're building up models for the photonic layers. We can get cost models for the memories. And then we then want to see, well, what's it like to program this system? How do we go about it? 
So we need some sort of sand pit to do it. Now, traditionally in computer architecture, it's been you know it's littered with pa pa uh, papers that are based on software simulations. Okay, but they really are too slow when you get large scale, uh, large number of processors. For, for sort of two reasons. One, uh, you've got to simulate large numbers of processors. And the other is that actually a lot of the statistical properties, you know, you've got large numbers of caches, you've got a lot happening, and you tend to have, to have longer real-time runs to actually get any useful data. And so this is why there's, you know, people like Dave Patterson in Berkeley, lots of people have been saying, oh, come on, finally, we ought to prototype things. You know, people have been using FPGAs to prototype stuff for a while. But you know, there's a there's a big mo uh, uh, big motivation to do this, and a lot of momentum to build on FPGAs. Also, interestingly, the CAD tools are getting better. Amazingly, we always complain about CAD tools, but they are getting better. And uh, the other thing that's interesting is, as Avi was saying, you know, as pe like people like Intel and AMD are hitting power boundaries, they're having to actually make their CPU simpler. So we've got this interesting intersection where you know, the commercial processors are getting simpler anyway, and the CAD tools are getting better. And so in fact, prototyping things uh, from an academic point of view is getting easier. Okay, so what sort of, what, what sort of uh, systems might we start off with? Well, here's one of, the, one of the many boards we're using. Just bought 70 odd of these to put in a big box. So this is you know, just a, a field program we'll go to a evaluation board. So we've got a big FPGA. This has loads of high-speed serial links in it. So you know, we've got four lots of gigabit ethernet. Um, in fact, it's got a PCI Express thing. We put a, our own board on here that breaks those serial links out to SATA links. We've got more SATA links here. That gives us 72 gigabits of bi-directional communication. So really useful from a communication communication point of view and quite a decent amount of memory you know eight gigs of memory so this really is you know a fairly powerful computer and these are not that expensive okay so you can put lots of these in the box um, we've gone down the route of just trying to use a commodity evaluation board it just reduces costs there's really no research in building your own FPGA board uh, we just did this tiny customized uh, board to do a bit of wiring. Well, I say a bit of wiring. It's still differential microstrip and stuff. It's not completely trivial. OK. So if we're going to build an example configuration, we could, buy, you know, we could have 64 of these boards. That would give us you know, half a terabyte of DRAM. We, we've got all these high-speed communication links. We can build a 3D torus, basically 3D cube wrap the ends around. Uh, we could easily get 128. We've got a MIP64 we've got in-house. We can easily get 128 of those mapped onto that. And, and also, you know, compared with, hardware's so cheap now, but I mean, compared with workstations from the early 90s, you know, it's, it's not that much money, really. So we can actually build a system that uh, hopefully starts looking really interesting to people designing software. OK, the other thing we can do with FPGAs is we can play a bit of a trade-off. We can do a direct implementation, or we could say it's an emulation platform. And this kind of gets interesting. So we've got a we could have 128 cores running at, say, 200 megahertz, or do we want to emulate uh, you know, 25,000 odd cores running at one megahertz. Well, actually, we can easily do that with FPGAs. We can time multiplex the hardware. And that gets kind of interesting, because you know, even at one megahertz, you can easily boot an operating system. It's a lot faster than a software simulator. And we can still play around with having large numbers of cores. The other thing that's kind of interesting is if you are time multiplexing processors, so this is where you might have a nice deep pipeline but you put a, a, an instruction from a different thread down the pipeline every clock cycle, it actually makes the hardware simpler because you get rid of data and control hazards and all sorts of things, which tends to mean you can push the clock rate up. Uh, 
So that's kind of an interesting technique. and allows us to play with a large number of processors. And you could push this further. You could push it up to a million cores if you like. Although I think you would want a few more FPGA boards to make it really useful. The other thing I quickly mention is ECAD is getting better. Um, uh, I think electronic uh, uh, designers are, um, you know, still in the assembler era of programming, if you like. You know, very log and VHDL are very low level. Uh, there's quite a nice pro uh, system though that's come out of MIT from Arvind's MIT called BlueSpec, um, which is sort of looks a little bit like System Verilog if you squint at it one way, and if you, it looks more like Haskell if you squint at it another. Um, it actually provides types, <laughs> it's radical for electrical engineering, uh, but provides clean interfaces, and this is really important, robust modular composition, uh, a very fast simulator, efficient implementations, it basically spits out low level Verilog, and you can put that through all sorts of good tools. And actually we're finding it very good for rapid design, and I also teach a master's course on this, and find it works quite well at that level. Um, and in my opinion, I reckon I can teach somebody to build a blue spec system that's synthesizable, goes on FPGA, and it'll take them the same amount of effort as if they were trying to write a discrete event simulator in C. Oh. That'll be my argument. How long would it take to implement MIP64 blue spec? Um, about three months. So yeah, it depends how far you want to refine it. But uh, the first, you know, first cut about three months, something like that, possibly less. Uh, okay, so here's some of the things we've done in blue spec, just in case you're interested. We've got a MIP64, which we're actually starting to uh, bring up free BSD on at the moment. Uh, we've got a sort of ARM classic, so very early ARM instruction set. We've got a network in uh, network on chip design that needs a bit of refinement. We've also got interfaces to that plug into Altera's tools for FPGAs. Um, but for example, you, you know, you're talking about prototyping things. Uh, I had a, a final year project student this year who uh, took some research from the University of York, a graph reduction machine. He had to sort of learn blue spec and then build this graph reduction machine. And he's actually he's not the brightest of students. He only got 2-2 the other year. Uh, and he still managed to do it. So, you know. Um, I thought that's quite impressive. Okay, so I'll just quickly finish up talking about a couple of, a few research projects uh, in case anybody's interested in collaborating on this, some of this stuff. Um, we've got a project that's sort of finishing off looking at the communication centric side of things, so trying to teach, treat communication as a first class design constraint. I don't think I'll say any more about that. Got an ongoing project actually with people like Steve Ferber. Uh, so Steve, as many of you will know, was one of the fathers of the ARM processor. Um, and he's a professor in Manchester. And uh, he's, you might even say, hell-bent on building a one million ARM processor machine uh, to do large-scale real-time simulation of things like neuronal systems. Um, we've got quite a big grant to do that. and. They've got, they're going down an ASIC route, uh, which gives them one perspective on this. We're doing more of the FPGA and architectural exploration of this project. And it covers all sorts of things, power efficiency, networking, parallel algorithms, uh, algorithm mapping, fault tolerance, all sorts of stuff. That's lots of good fun. I've got a DARPA-funded project that uh, I'm part of. I'm not leading this one, leading the others. Um, based actually on a, a paper done by a PhD student in the security group, Robert Watson. Um, he won the USENIX uh, Security Conference Best Paper Award for uh, Capsicum, a practical capability system. But he observed that uh, they really needed hardware support to make this trustworthy system really function efficiently. And in fact, we're using our MIP64 and adding um, capability-based mechanisms to it uh, as we speak. Okay, so to conclude, look at that, almost back on time. Uh, <laughs> so I don't think there's a need really uh,
for parallel software techniques to be constrained by current commodity software. And what I'm really hoping to do to contribute uh, to the community is actually putting a lot of these designs out there. I mean, in fact, particularly with this DARPA project, we're mandated uh, on basically putting it all into the public domain uh, so that we get systems out there, people, people can buy uh, commodity board, FPGA boards and so on, and build systems up and play around with parallelism techniques at many, many different levels. Okay. Um, and the other final comment is, uh, I'm still fascinated by this one, the communication costs are really becoming very, very significant. And actually thinking at the many levels um, what the implications are of that, I think is going to uh, be fascinating in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you very much.